Welcome, everyone. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Geonim, the era, essentially easy way to remember it, from the year 600 to the middle of the 11th century. And the story of the Geonim is going to take place essentially at the same time of the story we talked about last week, when the Islamic Empire is going to overrun most, much of the world and the overwhelming majority of Jews are going to come under their rule. And essentially since then, since the 7th century when the Muslim Empire, the Islamic Caliphate, takes over much of the world, the Sephardic, what's known today as the Sephardic Jews, Jews in Arabia, Jews in North Africa, Jews in Babylon, Jews in Asia Minor, are all going to be under Islamic control for the most part of history since then, until they moved to Israel. Uh, Spain is going to be an interesting flashpoint between the Islamics and the Christians. They're going to be battling it back and forth for a long time. Now, the conditions under Islamic rule are going to be markedly better than under the Byzantines. So essentially, when the Muslims were coming in their masses, a lot of the Jews who were living under the Byzantines welcomed them with open arms. Now, things were really good, kind of okay, under the Muslims, but they weren't fantastic. The Jews and the Christians were given what's known in Islamic religion, the dhimmi status, which means protected people, but also means second-class citizens. To be protected means you're not going to be slaughtered, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, the non-monotheists were given an option, you either convert or you die. But the dhimmis, the protected class, the Jews and the Christians, they could practice the religion but they were treated as second-class citizens. So, for example, they're not permitted to convert anyone to the religion. They were also prohibited to prevent any co-religionists, any Jew or Christian, from converting to Islam. They had to pay a special tax. Things that were a nuisance to the Muslims, like loud prayers or blowing the shofar, were not allowed to be done. So we have generations of Jews that prayed inaudibly, and now the Sephardim today, they make up for it by praying all loudly. Uh, they were not allowed to ride uh, horses or camels, because that was too high, too exalted of a uh, of a mode of transportation, unbefitting of the dhimmis. They were only allowed to ride on donkeys. They weren't allowed to testify against the Muslim, which essentially meant they didn't really have the uh, legal rights under the law. And they weren't allowed to build a shul, a synagogue, higher than a mosque, which is why if you go to the old city of Jerusalem, where they had a fledgling Jewish community in the 13th century, all the shuls are subterranean because they weren't allowed to build them uh, above ground. In some societies, uh, they also had various forms of demeaning treatment, forms of humiliation. So, for example, we know, of course, about the yellow star under the Nazis. That was actually a reformulization of what happened in the 9th century where Jews under Islamic control were forced to wear a yellow belt. Uh, in 11th century, the Jewish women were forced to wear uh, one black shoe and one red shoe, which I think if it was today, people say that's a nice new fashion, but then it was a form of humiliation. You look at pictures of old Yemenite Jews, and they all dressed like beggars. And the reason why is because they were forced to, under the dhimmi status, to dress like that. Jews were forced to walk in certain places, not walk in certain places, that said, the Jews fared much better under the Muslims than they did under the Christians. And I like to think of this as somewhat of a historical fact that's interesting yet counterintuitive. When do Jewish societies flourish? I think, I think there's this sweet spot where we flourish, where things are okay, but not fantastic and not horrific, you know? If it's fantastic, I would say like it is in America today, where you have full rights and Jews can participate in every, every facet of society, unfortunately there's a trend of assimilation, of lack of identification as Jews, of abandoning of the cherished institutions of our faith, and that's of course terrible. I would say that the Jews are very successful in America, but Judaism is floundering and failing and faltering, unfortunately, in America, we're all familiar with those numbers. Um, in other societies where we had forced expulsions and where we were persecuted overtly, one last study told in any way, we also did pretty poorly. But there's this sweet spot where we kind of have a little pressure that's keeping us in check. We don't have the free-for-all like we have, let's say, in other places in America. Uh, and on the other hand, we're not completely uh, mistreated 
and uh, brutalized, that's, I think, where we flourish. So under the Muslims, things were okay. They weren't the best, but the Jews did just fine. Now, the epicenter of Jewish life is still in Babylon. And what's really nice about this is that the Muslims, the new caliphate known as the Umayyads, they controlled the Jews from afar. Their headquarters was in Syria, in Damascus. And they were preoccupied with war, with conquest. So the Jews living in Babylon, where the vast majority of Jews were living, and of course the epicenter of Jewish life, the vast institutions of Torah, they were allowed to essentially live as they pleased. And that's essentially going to continue for the other caliphates to follow. In the middle of the 8th century, a group of Muslims called the Abbasids, they became the new rulers in town when the Umayyads went to Constantinople and they were, and they had a terrible loss against the, against the Christians. So the Abbasids took over essentially their, their empire and the Umayyads. I know this, these names kind of bleed together, but the Umayyads, they moved to Spain and they had like in government in exile, but they essentially followed the same philosophy of be, you know, live and let live with the Jews. And this time period essentially marks the high point of Islamic history. This is like the golden age of Islamic history. Today, uh, Islam, unfortunately, is a lot of uh, barbarism, a lot of, uh, a lot of hatred, a lot of violence that we see. Uh, at that time, the motto of the Abbasids was the ink of the scholar that's holier than the blood of the martyr. And they stressed more than anything else the value of knowledge. So during this time, uh, the Muslim war becomes an intellectual center for all forms of education, science, medicine, writing, poetry, uh, things that we don't necessarily associate with Islamic culture today. But at that time, it was a golden age uh, for that kind of Islam. And we see Islam kind of has this pendulum quality to it, where it swings back and forth from more moderates and a more modern interpretation of the Quran to a much more extremist, literal interpretation of the Quran, where you read sentences like, oh, the bush is going to say, where's the Jew and come kill him. Uh, obviously, when cultures, Islamic cultures, take that seriously, they don't necessarily have such a symbiotic, really a peaceful relationship with the Jewish people. But this time, the initial empire, it was very much the opposite. It was more modern and much more welcoming to the Jews, and they essentially had independence and autonomy and self-governance. And we find remarkably that the Jews existed like a little a little jurisdiction within a grander empire. Uh, they had the Reish Tolusa. Reish Tolusa was called a king. He was like the king of the Jews. He was the political leader and he would do all the go-between between the population and the overlords and the initially it was the Persians and then it was the Muslims. Uh, and this was a direct descendant of King David. It had a, kind of the feeling of monarchy to it. And this office was actually formed after the destruction of the first temple, and it continued into the 12th century of the Common Era. So we've talked about it a little bit, but you have an office, an institution, the Maestro Lusa, that continued almost uninterrupted for almost 1,800 years, which is an astonishing reign. That was like the political half of the leadership of the people, and you have on the other side the rabbinic or the Torah leadership, and those two essentially work together most times to be a leadership for the Jews in the diaspora. Sometimes they got into scuffles, uh, but over the course of history, there's going to be a, a migration of power where uh, the racial loose is the political leader of the people. He's the one who's in touch with the local authorities, and that power gets transitioned more and more to the rabbis and to the Torah authorities. Now, we spoke about last week that there was a shift between uh, the Sassanians, the Persians, to the Muslims. Now, at the end of the Sassanian Empire, there was a full-fledged assault on the office of the Reish Galusa. Uh, there was an individual whose name was Marzutra. A whole story, his father was Zutra as well. There's a lot of details in the saga of this particular strand of the Reish Galusa tree, but he was uh, attacked. His family, his house was attacked by some tribe, and he mounted a rebellion against the Persian Empire. 
and he had a small army and he managed to take over a province uh, and he had some sort some degree some semblance of law and order for a couple of years but unfortunately it didn't last very long and the little state that they had built was crushed by the Persians and he was executed and they essentially stopped granting autonomy to the Reish Galusa. So we have this period where the power is going to be severely weakened and curtailed from the Reish Galusa at the end of the Persian slash Sassanian Empire. Now there's an individual, a very important Jewish figure, who is going to be the crossover individual, the person who's going to kind of begin his reign under the Persians, but ultimately is going to be the first Reish Galusa, the first official political leader of the people under the Muslims, and he's actually going to be the forbearer of all future Reish Galusas. For the next 800 years, they're all going to be direct descendants of this individual whose name is Bustanai. Now, Bustanai was the son of Hanina. Uh, Haninai, actually, pronounced Haninai. Uh, his father was the Reish Galusa, and the king of Persia, whose name was Chosros II in the 580s, he decided to eradicate the Jewish people. Like we mentioned last time, at the end of the Persian dynasty, they had made a full-fledged attack against the Jewish people. So he decides to go after the Jews. He kills thousands of Jews uh, tragically. He imprisons thousands others. And he especially targeted the house of the Reish Galusa, the royal Davidic line. So he killed Haninai, the Reish Galusa himself, and his his wives, and his brothers, and his cousins, and his uncles, and everyone of that family. And his pregnant wife, the wife or the daughter-in-law, it depends how different stories, different accounts, uh, who was pregnant and contained the last child of this dynasty, of the Davidic line, allegedly, at least that's how the story goes, she had to go into hiding. And there's a very dramatic, legendary tale about what happened, and what changed, and what brought to the reinstitution of Bustanai as the Reish Galusa. And the story goes that the king, Chosros II, he had a dream, and he was in, he found himself in this amazing palace garden, laden with all these beautiful trees and all these fruit trees, everything so delightful and delectable and delicious. And he got envious, the fact that this garden is someone else's garden, and not his, so he starts taking an axe, in his dream, and going to chop down all the trees. And he's just swinging his axe with rage against all these trees, and he starts knocking them all down, and there's just the whole, the whole garden is smoldering, and there's this one little sapling. That's the only thing that's left standing. And he's about to go with his axe and swing at it at the little sapling, until a man shows up, an old man with a ruddy face, and he grabs him, he starts screaming at him, he pulls the axe out of his hand, dramatically he starts swinging the axe at him, the king in his dream gets all terrified, and they have a whole conversation, and this old man tells him, why are you destroying my garden? He says, well, I don't know, I'm sorry, I apologize, don't kill me. They have a whole back and forth, and he promises, that the king does in his dream, to not destroy the last sapling. And in one dramatic retelling of the story, the king wakes up and he's actually covered in blood. And he freaks out and he calls all his people and try to figure out what this, this means and what did he pledge in his dream. And someone told him that there's, a, in a way similar to the Yosef story, there's one of your prisoners languishing in the prison. He may have the solution. They pull him out and the man's reeking from being left in a prison, in a dungeon, in a little rat hole. And he says, oh, okay, you bring it to the king. We'll have to clean you up. He says, no, I want to go the way I am right now. He goes and meets the king. He says, well, actually, I had the same exact dream, and I know the other side of it and what you're missing. He tells him that garden represented the garden, the family of David. And that old man that you saw with the ruddy cheeks, he was King David. And he's upset at you, and he's going to kill you, come after you, if you start up. You try to destroy his garden. There's one little sapling in hiding. Don't kill him. So he releases, frees all the slaves. They find that expectant mother to give her room in the royal palace. And her son, Bastanai, from the Persian word Bastan, which means a garden, he eventually becomes the Reish Galusa. And he crosses over from being 
uh, the head of the Jews under the Sassanians to being the head of the Jews under the Muslims. When the Caliph Omar, he took over that place, he actually assigned one of the daughters of the previous Persian king, he gave him as a gift to Bostanai. So Bostanai actually married two women. He had his Jewish wife, and then he had his other wife who converted to Judaism, but she was an, a, originally a Persian princess. And he's going to have children from both wives, and the race Delusas that are going to result uh, from the next 400 years of history are going to be solely the descendants of Bustani from both of these women. Now, this story, this dramatic story, it's likely, parts of it for sure are not true. We know for sure. Uh, the notion that this Bustani was the last descendant of King David, we know that for a fact to not be true because we know other descendants of King David that were not descendants of Bostonai. That's number one. And the reason given why uh, this story was embellished, most certainly, uh, was to bolster the stature of this family. This family is going to be political leaders of the Jewish people. The idea, or at least the legend, true or otherwise, that they are the last remaining sapling of the house of David helped solidify and bolster and buttress their stature as the governing family of the Jewish people. When the Muslims come, this institution, the institution of Rishkulusa and self-governance is going to be strengthened. Uh, there is a 16th century book on Jewish history called the Shevet Yehuda, and he describes just that. This is a quote. After the persecution of the Jews had started towards the end of the Persian rule, as we've seen, the power and authority of the Persian king went into steady decline until eventually the Ishmaelites, which is the Arabs, the Muslims, came against them, defeating them and conquering the whole Persian empire. The Muslim ruler was a righteous man who sent for the Jews and spoke kindly to them, allowing, giving them assurances and allowing them to remain in their own faith if they so desired, saying that a religion that is forced upon people is never of any value. Unfortunately, parenthetically, the Muslims don't necessarily believe that today. The Persian inhabitants of the country also made their mistake, saying that their utter collapse was a punishment for their ill treatment to which they had subjected the Jewish population. From then on, the Jews were allowed to manage their own affairs. Uh, all this to be found in the historical records of the Persian Empire, which are roughly fine. So we have, a, really, it's a golden opportunity for the Jews. The Jews are now allowed uh, their foes, the Christians, the Byzantines are now gone, uh, for the most part, from most areas, most at least the central areas uh, where the Jews were living. The Persians, who also were very harsh to the Jews, they're also gone. And there is obviously a flourishing of Torah, specifically in the bastions of Torah, in the epicenter of the epicenter, in Sura and Pumpadisa, those great institutions we've discussed already, founded in the 3rd century by Rav and Shmuel that are going to be extant for 800 years and the center of Jewish life in Babylon. They're a very powerful, unifying force. Uh, today we have the Ashkenazi Jewish community and the Sephardic and the Americans and the Israelis and that causes some problems, differences in custom. People pray differently. You go to a different synagogue. Everything's a little slightly different. These two yeshivas, they were the flagship yeshivas of the Jewish people. Every town of the community would send their best and brightest there, and they would go back, and they would provide the rabbis and the clergy for all Jewish communities worldwide. And that was very powerful benefit that they, that they brought. Now, there is a midrash, a fantastic midrash, in the Tanchuma in Parshas Noach. And the Midrash reads that the Almighty makes a covenant with Israel that the oral Torah would not be forgotten from their mouths nor the mouths of their descendants to the end of all generations. The Almighty is promising that the Torah that he gave to us will never cease. There's never going to be a break in the chain, in the link in the chain, that's going to cause Torah to be forgotten. And therefore, this is a quote, the Holy One Blessed is He established two yeshivos for the people of Israel, where they study Torah day and night, and where they assemble from all occasions twice a year in Adar and Elo to discuss and debate and engage in the 
struggle of Torah, the war, warfare of Torah, the Melchamta Shal Torah, until every matter is thoroughly explained and the true Allah has determined. And these two Shivas saw neither religious persecution nor captivity nor plunder, not from the Gre- Greeks, not from the Byzantines, not from the Romans, and they survived and flourished. These two yeshivas had a shorthand name they were called. There was one Sur, one Papadisa, and they were called Gaon Yaakov, the majesty of Jacob, because they represented the, the zenith, the apex, the acme of, of Jewish life. The heads of those yeshivas, the de facto heads of the Jewish community as well at large, the worldwide Jewry, were known by the title of Rosh Yeshiva Gaon Yaakov, the head of the yeshiva, which yeshiva? The yeshiva that's called Gaon Yaakov, but that was shortened to just being called a Gaon. Later, this term gets used to describe someone who's a great genius as a Gaon. At that time, during this era, it's specifically referring to one of the heads of the yeshiva in Sur or Pupadisa for about the 500 years that we're discussing, a little less than 500 years, uh, those are known as the Gaonim. So you have the, the, every, every town, every point in time during this era, we're going to have two Gaonim, one Sur, one Pumadisa, and one Reish Tolusa. And this triumvirate, these three people are going to be the leaders of the Jewish people. And they work really nicely together. They have a system of checks and balances that's uh, very modern, I would say. So, f- so first of all, each one of them presided over their own region. They took Babylon divided into three regions, and each one of the three leaders was given one of them. Each maintained their own independent court, and each was responsible for nominating the heads, local heads of communities that would operate throughout the land. Uh, this was these were robust Jewish communities. They had centers, Sur and Popadisa, uh, where people came to study, but they would also have very developed infrastructure of Jewish life in every local town at the time. Unlike today, it's a very fairly modern idea to have individual taxation. The way it always was in Jewish history is that the Jews were taxed as a collective. The local host nation would assign a tax, a lump sum on all of the Jewish community, and it was the job of the community leaders to extract uh, from their constituents those taxes, and these leaders oversaw every aspect of Jewish life, Jewish schools, shuls, charities of every variety <coughs> and stripe. These were very dynamic, uh, robust Jewish communities. What does it take to be a Gaon? You want to be a Gaon? Quite simply, we find the Me'iri, one of the Rishonim, one of the medieval rabbis, he, in his introduction to Perke Avos, Chapters of the Fathers, he gives a nice overview of Jewish history. So he says like this, those who were certified as Gaonim were not accustomed to leave the tent of Torah day or night. They were always studying Torah. And they knew the entire Talmud by heart. The words of the entire Torah and of Shur Tanakh were as ready to them, were as available to them like the words of the Shema. You know the words of the Shema? Say the words of the Shema. You know the backwards? You can say backwards? You can say backwards? That's how well they knew the Tanakh and the Talmud. And for this reason, continues the Me'iri, that they did not consider it necessary to elaborate at length in their writings, since the entire explanation of the Talmud was so familiar, and in their eyes to write out the explanation of the laws of the Talmud would be like one who, in our days, simply translated the words. These Ga'onim had such mastery over Talmud that they never even considered to write an interpretation of Talmud, a commentary on the Talmud, why would someone do that? It says the Me'iri, it's like writing a translation of the Talmud. Now we know today, in our days, a translation of the Talmud is very necessary because we don't know what the words even mean. But in the times of the Me'iri, everyone knew what the words meant, just not everyone understood how to interpret them, how to understand them. They're somewhat complex. In the times of the Ga'onim, everyone knew how to understand them as well. This is the generation's uh, coming right after the, the writing and the sealing of the Talmud, and that became common knowledge amongst everyone, and certainly amongst the Gaonim, who were absolute experts. An average scholar of, uh, an average a graduate of such an institution were experts in at least three orders of the Talmud. Uh, that was the minimum. Now, they had an interesting system of checks and balances, this triumvirate. The Reish Galusa, 
when they would die, the Geonim, the heads of the yeshiva and Surah Pavadisa, were responsible for appointing the next Reish Galusa. And when one of the heads of the yeshiva, one of the Geonim, would die, then the Reish Galusa, they had the responsibility of appointing who would be the next uh, Rosh Yeshiva, be the next Geon. And that system kind of really kept things in balance and it kept the balance of power evenly distributed between the political and the religious leadership of the people. And that worked very well for the most part. There were times, as we will see, where it did not quite work really well and unfortunately they each tried to interfere with their others' responsibilities and would use the power vested in them to deliberately try to undermine the their counterparts. So they would not hire the best guy for the job. Uh, and the mo- person most qualified who would most be the, the biggest draw uh, and would diminish their own stature, they'd say, you know what, we're not going to hire you in passing you. We're going to hire someone else, and that way I'll maintain my stature unquestioned and undiminished by anyone else. But for the most part, though those were the exceptions. We'll learn some about some of those stories. For the most part, it worked out fairly well. Now, during this time, um, when the Muslim conquest, the very swift conquest of the lands of the Persians and the Byzantines, there was a tremendous positive benefit brought to the Jewish community as a whole. And that is that it brought the Jews under one government, under under one jurisdiction. Previously, it was very tenuous. If you lived uh, under one government and you wanted to get a question to the rabbi in Babylon, you had to go through customs and they were warring all the time. And that that caused a lot of problems in commerce, of course, but certainly in the flow of ideas as well. So Jews and Jewish communities were somewhat isolated from the nerve center in Babylon. Now, uh, we see a tremendous increase of questions given from all corners of the world to the Gaonim. Now, the thoroughfares are opened from the Indian Ocean east all the way to the Atlantic through North Africa to the west. All that was united under one rule that was fairly benevolent to the Jewish people. So Babylon, again, rose to prominence as the de facto headquarter of the Jewish world and where all Jewish communities would reach out to when they had a question. You want to find a new rabbi and you're in Morocco and Fez, where do you go? You go send a letter, send us a candidate. You have a question, the rabbi doesn't know, your local rabbi will send to where the thousand greatest rabbis in the world are studying Torah day and night. Send them the question and they'll give you your response. Those kinds of letters are known as responsa, chuvos, and we have literally today, we have extant thousands of responsa written by the various to own him over the years. It's an astonishing figure given, first of all, how long ago this was. This is 11, 12, 1300 years ago. Uh, who knows how many numbers were actually written, maybe tens of thousands, I would say probably likely hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions uh, of, of questions and answers were, were, were given. But also at a time when the rest of the world, or certainly in Europe, where Europe was going through its dark ages, there was a a renaissance of Torah in the Jewish world. Now these questions dealt with every aspect of Jewish life. Uh, In interpretation of the Talmud, you had a problem with the Talmud, there's no commentaries, remember, written on it. But you have a goan. The goan's like asking Google. They know all the answers. Uh, you have a question in practice, in halacha, in Jewish philosophy. You have a disagreement with your neighbor about the wall separating the two of you. You have, you're fighting with your wife. What do you do? You write a letter to the goan and he gives you a response. Basically, every aspect of, of, of life as a Jew had the benefit of direct link with the goanim, uh, who would answer their question. The Rambam, many years later, writes, quote, Many questions were addressed by people from every town to the Gon who lived their time, requesting him to explain for them difficult matters in the Talmud, and they, the Gonim, would reply in accordance with their wisdom, and the questioners would collect the replies and make books of them from which to understand. So this is the beginning of the publishing of works after the Talmud. The Talmud was written, it was such a complete and fantastic job, 
it was the end of all butch, right? You have it all there, the Talmud. Under the Gaonim, we find, the first kind of book we find, compilations of various chuvos, of various responsa written by the Gaonim. You pile them together, you gather a whole bunch of them, you staple them together, and you copy them. You don't staple them together, but figuratively, you would compile them, and now you have a whole book, and you can organize it by topic, and that would be a very useful, handy guide. And uh, there's an amazing tshuva here written that I've seen here. Even Jews who were still living under the harsh rule of the Byzantines, they found a way to smuggle their questions to the Gaonim, and there's an amazing responsa regarding whether or not you could say uh, the Musaf, during the Musaf Kedushan Shabbos, if you say Shema. If you notice in, in the prayer that we say on Shabbos, during Musaf, during the second prayer on Shabbos, during the Kedusha, in the, in the, in the Chazan repetition of the Shmon Esrei, they say Shema, Shema Yisrael, Shem Ritein, Shem Echad. It's in there. And the reason for that was that during the Byzantine era, they issued a decree of religious persecution of Shema against the Jews in Israel. And one of the things that they forbade was saying the Shema during prayer. So the Jews would not allowed to say Shema during the prayer. So what they did they, instead of saying the Shema during the correct location of the prayer, before Shmon Esrei, they snuck it in during the Kedusha of Musaf. And the question that they had sent to Rabbi Yehudai Gon, one of the great Gonim, was now that the Byzantines are gone, what do we do? We spent a few hundred years now saying the Shema during Musaf. Should we put it back in its original place? What should we do? So he writes to them, However, now that the Holy One, blessed is he, has ended the rule of Edom, of Byzantium, and annulled the decrees, and in their place have come the Ishmaelites, who permit the Jews to study Torah, to recite the Shema, and to pray, one may not recite the prayers out of order. Rather, one should say everything in its proper place, in accordance with the ordinance of our sages, Torah in the proper place and time, the prayers in the proper place and time, the Shema should be in its correct location, Move it back to where it's supposed to be. That's what he writes. Now it's interesting, if you actually look at our sitter that we have today, it still has the Shema in the Musaf on Shabbos. And the reason for that is, because another girl had a different perspective on it. And he wrote his letter. And he said, when the decree was annulled, the Shema was recited in its proper place, and the regular prayers, prayers were possible, and there were those, i.e., he's referencing the previous letter that we read, who wished to remove the Shema from the Kedush, from Musaf altogether. But the sages of the generation decided to leave it in the, in, in the Musaf service so that the miracle should not be, should be made known for all generations, the miracle that the harsh rule of the Byzantines were removed. And that's why today, on Shabbos, not today, but on Shabbos, when we have the Musaf prayer, we say the Shema as a means of remembering the wonderful miracles that the Almighty did for us by bringing us the Muslims. Now, if you had this as uh, a trivia, I don't think most people would, you know, if you had four options, why do we say Shema during Musaf? One of them is to thank the Almighty for the Muslims. I don't imagine most people would select that. <laughs> but in context, historically, they replaced the Byzantines, who were much worse and did not allow us to say the Shema in its correct place, to think that we kind of have this lasting monument towards the good times that came to the Jews now in our Shabbos prayers. Now, all the Gaonim, of course, it does not even need to be said, were fantastic scholars. I want to look at some of the early Gaonim who've had really lasting legacies until today, importantly because they wrote books that are that were the first books written after the Talmud. So the first one of them is by the, is someone by the name of Rab Achai Gon. He's called Rabbi Achai Gon, despite the fact that he was not one of the hundred and some odd Gaonim who headed the yeshiva in Sura. And the reason why, and like we mentioned earlier, is because the Reish Dolusa tampered with the process. So Rabbi Shmuel, who was the Gon prior, he died, and everyone knew who was going to be the replacement, Rabbi Achai. He was a natural successor. But the Reish Dolusa instead decided to take Rabbi Chai and pass on him 
and give it to Rabbi Chai's own disciple, Rabbi Nutrai. And this was because he had some sort of hatred to Rabbi Chai. And we see this kind of brewing conflict between these two institutions. So he says, I don't like you, and therefore I have the power to, to pass on you. I'm going to give it to someone else. I'm going to, I'm going to make you uh, just be a, you know, you were groomed for the job, and you're obviously the greatest Torah scholar around. I'm going to hire your student. He's going to be the groan. So he was disappointed, of course, with the injustice that was done to him. Rabbi Chai, he left Babylon, and he moved to Israel. And it's actually looked back historically by the great Jewish historians as a blessing in disguise. The greatest rabbi of his time was now not in Babylon, because you know why? They probably didn't need him so much in Babylon as much as they need him in other places in Israel, where there was a dearth of great Torah scholars. This is kind of the blessing and the curse of having these great institutions. On one hand, you have a central location where all Jews could go for consultation, where Torah can be codified and clarified and organized and disseminated from. But on the other hand, what, what, what do you do with the rest of the Jewish communities that are bereft of the great Torah giants? That is something that you have, that's a trade-off that you make. And we see during this particular episode that the Almighty assured that the most natural candidate to replace the uh, outgoing Grace Delusa is going to be passed for the job. He's going to move and move to Israel and strengthen the Jewish community there. Historically, we still call him a groan because everyone knows that he really was the pr- proper person for the job. And if anyone fulfilled the qualifications needed, it was him. And he wrote the first book after the Talmud. It's called the Sheiltos of Rabbi Achai Gon. Uh, this book is written on the weekly Parsha. And what it does is it every chapter, it has four sections, very nicely organized. It also reads very nicely, even, uh, even 1,500 years later after it's written. What they would do is he would take a certain issue of, of the Parsha, and he would expand, expound on it and pull all the laws of the Talmud on it. And then he would ask a certain question. And the third part, he would have an agadic teaching that would not seem initially to be related at all to the subject at hand. And the fourth part, we're bringing all the pieces together, answer the question, and tie it all in really nicely with the agadic, the philosophical aspect of his, of his discourse. And this was essentially intended to be for Shabbos. Every Shabbos, the Shabbos, you eat the Parsha of the week, and Shabbos afternoon, what does everyone do? You take a little nap, then you go to the synagogue, and the rabbi gives a, a lecture, a discourse. And this was done throughout history, even the times of the Mishnah, we find descriptions of Rabbi Meir, if you remember. A long while back, we talked about Rabbi Meir. He would give these fantastic Shabbos drushas, these Shabbos lectures or discourses uh, that everyone would come and excited to, to, be, to attend. This was a whole book of such lectures, and he would kind of weave in the written Torah, the Parsha of the Week, along with the oral Torah, along with the lessons and laws. And this, I think, is also emblematic of the times. This is right after the Talmud has been sealed, and the Go'onim do a lot into integrating the Talmud into the psyche, into the consciousness of the Jewish people, and to give it kind of the authoritative calcification. This is the final authoritative word of the Oral Torah, and they, of course, would invoke that in their responsa, but this book does, obviously, personify that attitude by taking the oral Torah of a given parsha, of a given written Torah week, and mixing it all in in these she'iltos. The aforementioned Me'iri writes that the reason why he wrote this book, his motivation in front of the book, is that he had a, he had a son who was not really interested in getting into the nitty-gritty of Torah and going to the uh, scholarship and going to that route. So he said, I'm going to write a book that's going to spoon-feed it all to, to you. His contemporaries and the generation that came after, they all remark that this book is written so cleanly, so neatly, so precisely, so smoothly, no extra words, everything stands the test of time. In the 19th century, a monumental commentary is going to really reignite the passion of the study of the Sheiltos of Rabbi Achaidon, 
and that's going to be written by the great Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, known as the Nitziv, who is going to head the yeshiva in Volazhin. He's going to write his first book called the Hamik Shaila, deepening the Shaila, the question of the Shiltos, of the questions. Uh, and he's going to write in a tremendous, uh, very broad commentary on the Shi'iltos. That's the first major book written during the early Gaonim. There's another book by Rabbi Yehudai Gaon uh, called the Halachos Psukos, alternatively called the Halachos, Sefer Halachos Ketanos, the small book of Halacha. And he was the first to organize Halachic law of the Talmud, but to not include with it all the argumentation. You open up a book of Talmud and you find that the thrust of the scholarship is the give and take, the shaklavatari, the havais davai barava, the back and forth between the great rabbis and the argumentation of the sharp logical uh, debate that they engaged with. The result, the conclusions are very much an afterthought. It's there, but it's it's implicit very often, and even when it's explicit, it's just put there at the end. It's not there front and center. What he did is he organized the conclusions of of the Talmud and wrote a book of halacha uh, that was fundamental, again, the first of its kind to do that. The reason why it's called Halachas Ketanos, the small book of Halacha, is because there's another book called Halachas Gedolos, also written by one of the Geonim, who incidentally is actually, was also not one of the Geonim. The only two people that were called Geonim but weren't uh, were these two people. And he, in this book called, in shorthand, the Bahad, the Baal Halachas Gedolos, the author of the Halachic conclusions in the book Halachas Kedolos. He wrote an introduction to his work, which was considered groundbreaking at the time. He organized a list of the 613 mitzvos. We know the Talmud tells us cryptically the 613 mitzvos, and good luck trying to figure out what's a mitzvah, what's a general category, and what's a subcategory. He organized that, the first one to do that. And again, he quotes not only the Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, but also those two preceding books that we mentioned. Now, this is going to be the beginning of what's going to be a multi-decade effort to codify halacha. It's all drawn from an understanding of what the role of Babylonian Talmud is. It's likely, maybe in an alternative universe, that the Babylonian Talmud was not necessarily destined to have achieved its status that it did. It's possible to conjure such a scenario. But what the Talmud became was the final word of Torah, of oral Torah. Everything that you draw from then on thenceforth is pulled from the Talmud itself. That's why it's very natural, as a result, to try to look for ways to collect and codify and organize the Talmud itself, which is a codification of the Oral Torah, but the Halacha is there, it's mixed in, it's interspersed, it's baked into the fabric of the Talmud as the Halacha, but it's not front and center. So there's an effort which is still ongoing to organize the Halacha brought in the Talmud in a way that is relevant and useful and user-friendly to the people of the time. So already right away, the first couple of generations after the Talmud is sealed, we see the initial efforts, each one with their own flavor. This, of course, is going to reach a fever pitch during the medieval times under the Roshonim, when the Rambam, of course, is going to write a monumental book of halacha. He says, I'm going to do the, I'll do the best job ever. I'll organize all halacha, every single halacha found in the, Tal- in the Talmud, I'll organize it for you without any of the back and forth, any of the debate, just the bottom line. All you need is this, and you're good to go. And, you know, 10 other people did that as well. And then you have so much more voluminous, copious works of halacha written and still being written ever since. Now, the Goonic era that we started to talk about today, like we said, it's the time where there is a degree of stability amongst the broad Jewish world. There is uniformity. There is unity. There is unity. 
in practice, there's central leadership in the Reish Dolusa and in the Gaonim. All of the Jewish world kind of fits under this umbrella of the Babylonian Torah epicenters. They do a great job in integrating the Talmud into Jewish life and Jewish consciousness. It's going to last for about four to five hundred years. Depends exactly when you look at the starting point. Uh, oftentimes the starting point is given 589 as the starting point of the Gaonim to 1038 when the last of the Gaonim or of Hydron dies. And that's going to transition to the next era. Uh, next week, we're going to dig into some of the more great developments of the time. The Masoretic text that's going to be codified during this time. The Golden Age of Spain that we briefly mentioned. There's going to be a tremendous upheaval. It's going to rock the Jewish world. And that's going to be the Karaites. The Karaites are going to be a reformalization of the Sadducees. And that's going to really rock the boat for a little bit. There's going to be a changing face of world Jewry. There are going to be conditions that are going to lead to the end of the Gaonic era and, of course, the emergence of the new frontier of Jewish life in Europe. As we know, when one door closes, another opens. When the sun sets in one venue of Torah leadership, another rises elsewhere.